On April 7, 1994, members of the Hutu ethnic group in the eastern central African country of Rwanda heard a broadcast coming from the popular and extremist radio and television station RTLM, Radio Television Lemil Colin, radio television of the land of 1000 hills, the name many Hutu called Rwanda. The broadcast called on them to begin cutting down the tall trees. All Hutu knew the nickname for those Rwandans in the Tutsi minority, who were generally taller than most Hutu. With that call, members of the Hutu paramilitary groups into the Hamwe, those who work together, and the Impu Zamugambi, those who have the same goal, as well as Hutu members of the Rwandan army and police began one of the most sudden and rapid genocides in history, with machetes. From 1885 to 1961, Rwanda was a possession of two European countries, Germany from 1885 to 1919 and Belgium from 1919 to 1961. The same held true in neighboring Burundi, which was also populated by Hutu and Tutsi peoples. During this period, European ideas about ethnicity and racial superiority permeated much of Africa. To many Europeans, there was no doubt, white Europeans were superior to black Africans. But people are people, no matter what their color, and it doesn't take much for one group of people to hate another, even if they look very similar to each other. There is a long, complicated history of tribal relations and tribal warfare in Rwanda and the area around it. To the north, Uganda has had issues between different ethnic groups, and to the south, in Burundi, ethnic tensions got so high in 1972 and 1993 that hundreds of thousands of people were killed. In Burundi and Rwanda, the two dominant ethnic groups are the Hutu and the Tutsi. Caught between them and Rwanda are the Tuwa, a pygmy tribe who likely are the area's indigenous people. The Tutsi and Hutu moved into the region hundreds of years ago, and by the 16th century had established a variety of different kingdoms in the area. From the 16th to the 19th century, there were times of ethnic violence between the two groups. Though the level and frequency of this ethnic violence decreased when Europeans took over, tensions often ran high, and violence did occur. There were many reasons for the tensions between Hutu and Tutsi. One of them was simple, power. Hand in hand with power is economics. And finally, there are the illogical reasons that people use to set themselves apart or claim superiority over another around the world. Appearance, education or the lack of it, or just plain differences that the two groups simply don't understand, care to understand or willfully put down. When the Germans and later Belgians moved in, they largely controlled the ethnic violence in the area, mostly out of concern that large-scale violence would interfere with the economy of the area, which both nations profited from. Unfortunately, a byproduct of European control were European ideas about race and ethnicity. Let's be clear, we are not saying that the ethnic tension and the incredible violence of 1994 was caused by the legacy of European colonialism. It was not. There was plenty of ethnic hatred in the region before the arrival of the Germans and Belgians. But ideas that filtered into Rwandan society from the period of European control did not help the situation either. In the 1920s through the end of World War II, there was a popular scientific movement in Western Europe, North America and Australia called eugenics. Simply put, eugenicists believed that there were superior and inferior people in the world, and that perhaps through science, but also through the law and the changing of cultural norms, mankind will be best served if those who were superior ran things while those who were inferior supported the system. In other words, did the heavy lifting. Eugenics gave Europeans and white Americans a scientific basis for their belief in white supremacy. Let's be honest, 
While the vast majority of Europeans and white Americans were not marching in the streets and calling for ethnic violence like the Nazis and the Klan and the ignoramuses of today, it's safe to say the majority of Europeans and white Americans held some notions of white superiority, whether they displayed it overtly or held the feelings close to the vest. Before World War II, white superiority was not a fringe movement. It was part of everyday life. And it was that way in the European colonies in Africa as well. By the 1920s and 30s, eugenics had begun to influence government policy in Rwanda and elsewhere. You may have seen newsreels from World War II era Nazi Germany of scientists measuring the circumferences of skulls, eye color, height, and much more. Sadly, this was not unique to Nazi Germany. In the US, Britain, Canada, and Australia especially, similar studies took place, some leading to horrible results like forced sterilization and increased discrimination. In Rwanda, the Belgian colonial government institutionalized these beliefs. Of course, white Europeans were on top. Then came the Tutsis, then the Hutu, then the Tua. At the time, immediately prior to the 1994 genocide and today, the Tutsis were the minority group in the country, with the Tua at the very bottom. Just before 1994, it's estimated that the Tutsis made up about 15% of the nation's people, the Hutu about 83-84% to and the Tua 1-2%. to There were just under 8 million people in Rwanda in 1993. Even before the popularity of eugenics, the Belgians viewed the Tutsi as a superior group. They were generally taller, lighter skinned, and more Caucasian in their facial structure than the Hutu. And in the eugenics dominated 1920s, 30s, and 40s, this meant, well, you know, that the Tutsis were superior. And therefore, most of the jobs available to Africans in government, the police, and in the colonial army went to the Tutsi. What follows is a very simplified explanation. For their part, many Tutsi bought into the Belgian idea of their superiority. Honestly speaking, who wouldn't? Very few. For decades, in schools, books, and newspapers, it was the Tutsi who read and heard of their supposed superiority. The situation was sort of self-perpetuating. The Belgians believed the Tutsi to be superior to the Hutu, and not only gave the Tutsi more privileged and powerful positions, they also gave them land, some of which had belonged to Hutu groups. For Tutsi children, many of whom knew nothing except what the Belgian-run school system taught them, the fact that their people had the best jobs, had the most power, made the most money, well, guess what? It proved that they were superior. From the time the Belgians moved in, Rwandans were issued passes that indicated what ethnic group they belonged to, and this determined your access to education, a good job, and preferential treatment. The IDs were necessary, because in some cases, it was not possible to tell what group a person belonged to. That's how solid the science was. Needless to say, for every action, there is a counter-reaction. As time went by, resentment built among the Hutu. From 1945 to 1961, the United Nations took control of Rwanda, at least in name. Rwanda became the United Nations Mandate of Rwanda, but it was administered by the Belgian government. The idea was that in 15 years, the people of Rwanda would be educated and given control of their own country. However, by the late 1950s, many African people, from the Mediterranean in the north to the Cape of Good Hope in the south, had had enough of European colonialism. Many European countries spent the World War II and post-World War II years talking all about liberty, self-determination, and the need to control the human impulse towards prejudice. For the Holocaust had opened people's eyes to what could happen when prejudice went unchallenged. Except, to many people in Africa, as well as Asia, it seemed that Europeans didn't include them in those ideals. For many European nations, especially in Western Europe, seemed to believe that those principles only applied to them, among themselves. 
and they continue to hold power in territories around the world. Throughout Africa, independence movements began. Rwanda was no different, but its small size and divided population helped the Belgians maintain control. And truth be told, the Tutsis were worried that once the Belgians left, the Hutu would rise up and take power, and perhaps vengeance. The Hutu had overthrown the last Tutsi king of Rwanda in 1959, King Kigri V, whose family had ruled the country since the 1700s and was propped up in the 20th century by the Germans and Belgians. When he was forced out after just a few months on the throne, a period of instability began. It was hoped the stability would come when Rwanda officially gained its independence in 1961 and elected a Hutu president, but that was not to be the case. In 1963, two years after independence, militant Hutu both inside and outside the government fomented a violent attack on the Tutsi and approximately 130,000 Tutsi were killed, including most Tutsi politicians. This round of violence stemmed from rumors of the death of a Hutu leader. It wasn't true, but at this point, all the Hutu needed was an excuse. For their part, many Hutu had begun to believe that it was their group which was superior to the Tutsi. A new movement called Hutu Power had sprung up in the later 1950s, partly a reaction to Tutsi domination, and partly as a reaction to the growing popularity of pro-African literature, which was being published throughout the continent by anti-colonial groups. Much of this literature pointed out the age of African civilization compared to that of Europe, and glorified the ancient African kingdoms of the past, including the Hutu-dominated areas in Rwanda and Burundi. Additionally, the Hutu power movement pointed out that the Hutu had arrived and established their culture in the area long before the Tutsi, who they considered invaders, arrived. No one asked the Tua, most of whom were content enough to be left alone in the remote mountains and forests of the country, where they had lived semi-nomadic lives for centuries. The Hutu power movement grew throughout the 1970s, 80s, and early 90s, though it must be said that many Hutu, especially in the capital Kigali, were more moderate, and like moderate Tutsis, hoped that an equitable and peaceful nation might emerge and at times, it looked as if it were possible. In 1988, thousands of Tutsi who had fled the country in the 60s and their grown children formed the Rwandan Patriotic Front, RPF, and with support from Tutsi in neighboring nations and others, formed an army which began a civil war with the Hutu government of Yuvenal Habyarimana, who had taken control of the country in a bloodless coup in 1973. Habyarimana installed a totalitarian regime in the country, but at first, many looked upon his as a possible peacemaker between the two groups, for he was reluctant to support some of his own parties' programs to make sure Hutu were in positions of power throughout the country. The remaining Tutsi, located largely in the cities, especially Kigali, hoped that Habyarimana would be able to bring about some sort of arrangement that would bring peace to Rwanda and some assurances for the Tutsi. But as time went by, Habyarimana came more and more under the sway of militant Hutu in government and the army, and continued to ensure that Hutu remained dominant in the country, though not in the extreme way the Hutu power militants wanted. One of the other problems facing Habyarimana and Rwanda was extreme poverty. In 1989, a huge drop in coffee prices worldwide, the country's main export drove more people into poverty in an already extremely poor country. Habyarimana's government, Tutsi interference, and the Europeans were blamed by Hutu militants, who grew in power because of the economic bad times. By 1990, the RPF was advancing into the country from the north, west, and south. In 1992, Habyarimana had entered into talks with the RPF and its leaders, and the next year, a new agreement was drawn up which was supposed to be the basis of a new constitution, which included power sharing among the two groups. 
It took two more years of fighting and negotiation before the Arusha Accords, named for the town where the negotiations took place, were implemented and which opened government positions to everyone, regardless of ethnicity. Nine months later, Habyarimana was killed, as was the president of Burundi and the Rwandan army's chief of staff, shot down aboard a French plane shortly after takeoff in Kigali. Fingers were pointed in every direction. The RPF and its leader Paul Kagame were blamed. Hutu power groups were blamed because they were incensed at Habyarimana's dealings with the RPF. Some militants on both sides hinted that they believed the Belgians or the Europeans were behind the killing, hoping to dominate Rwanda once again. For years, who killed Habyarimana was a mystery, but in both 2006 and 2012, French investigators came to the same conclusion. Paul Kagame, leader of the RPF and leader of the country after the genocide, was to blame though he and his party vigorously denied involvement. That night, the RTLM radio station began calls for Hutu to rise up and cut down the tall trees, as well as crush the cockroaches. For almost two years, ever since Habyarimana entered into talks with the RPF, RTLM DJs had been ramping up the violent rhetoric against the Tutsis. What's more, Unlike some of the other stations many Hutu listened to, they played music. And this music was not simply music to dance to, it was music to kill to. The lyrics encouraged violence against the Tutsi and by 1993 was calling for outright genocide. The Tutsi are ferocious beasts, more cunning than the rhino. The Tutsi cockroaches are bloodthirsty murderers. They dissect their victims, extracting vital organs, heart, liver, and stomach. The nickname of the station became Radio Genocide, openly. For months, Hutu power groups had been meeting for the express purpose of planning a full-scale elimination of the Tutsi from Rwanda. They were just waiting for an excuse. Habyarimana's death provided it. Throughout the country, Hutu militants had been collecting weapons at secret locations, ready to be dispersed to the crowds of Hutu who were getting more and more worked up by both rumors of the assassination and RTLM broadcasts. On April 7th, the killing began in Kigali. Tutsi leaders and those who had spoken in favor of power sharing agreements were murdered in their offices, homes, and in hiding as were their families. Most of the killing, even though extremist members of the Rwandan military were present, was done with machetes and the clubs and scythes used on the inter Hamway flag. The next day, April 8th, the killings began throughout the country. Tutsi communities were invaded by huge numbers of inter Hamwe and Impuza Mugambi militias, literally screaming and singing for blood. At the top, members of Habyarimana's family and inner circle called Akazu or the Zero Network for their desire to see Rwanda with a zero Tutsi population coordinated some of the activity. Killing took place throughout the country. Chaos ruled. Some Hutu that were mistaken for Tutsi and did not have their papers on them were killed. Many moderate Hutu who had supported a power sharing agreement were also killed. Not all the Hutu in the capital and other towns were eager to take part in the killing, but were forced to by the militias. During these horrible events, the Rwandan army either stood aside or took part, but were taking their cue from Inter Hamwe. Some incidents became symbols of the killing. On April 9th, at the Polish mission church at Zikondo, over 100 Tutsi sought sanctuary. The crowd burst through the door and cut them to pieces. The news of this massacre spread and eventually made its way overseas, where people in Europe and the US began to understand that something horrible was happening in Rwanda. 
On the 15th to 16th of April, the Nyarubuye Catholic Church was the scene of another massacre. This time, not only had people sought shelter inside, but many Tutsi had been herded onto church grounds. There, thousands were gunned down, clubbed to death, and cut to pieces. Throughout this and other incidents, many Tutsi women were sexually assaulted, sometimes multiple times, and always publicly. Most were killed afterward. Those who survived feigned death and managed to escape, but the number was few. In the western town of Kibuye, 12,000 Tutsi were hacked to death in a local stadium. Perhaps 50,000 more were killed in the hills surrounding the town. In Kibuye, thousands of bodies were dumped into giant Lake Kivu, which bordered Rwanda and Congo. In the north, thousands more were dumped into the Kagera River, which feeds famous Lake Victoria. The nations bordering Rwanda had to ban use and drinking of the water for fear of disease. Many of the victims in western Rwanda near Lake Kivu were Tua, who had been regarded as inferior by both Hutu and Tutsi for decades or longer. The sight of these thousands of bodies make a shocking backdrop to the horror in the Oscar-winning film, Hotel Rwanda in 2005, which tells the story of the genocide and one man's attempt to rescue as many victims as possible. On the 28th and 29th, about 250,000 Tutsi were able to flee the country, mostly to neighboring Tanzania, a much more stable country. But by this time, most of the victims of the genocide were already dead. Early estimates put the number of dead at nearly 1 million. That has since been scaled back by most historians to somewhere between 500,000 and 800,000. By May, the RPF, which began to advance more quickly as the Rwanda army's discipline fell apart and the genocide began, took over the presidential palace in Kigali and slowly gained control of the country, which resulted in episodes of vengeance killing by Tutsi militia. By mid-July, the RPF announced that they would abide by the previous Arusha Accords, an attempt to build a power-sharing government. One last thing. It was not until the genocide was over that any real attempt by international forces to end it occurred. French troops landed in July and established a safe zone in the southwest of the country. But at that point, no one was really sure which group needed protecting, the now defeated Hutu or Tutsi survivors. The UN, the US and the leading European powers all came in for a great deal of criticism for their lackluster response to one of the most brutal episodes of the late 20th century. Thank you for watching. Please consider subscribing to our growing channel and punching the notification button to find out when our newest videos are released.